Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series that we are just concluding this week is on the book of Jeremiah. This particular lesson is entitled Lessons from Jeremiah. So we're going we're to look at some of the major issues in the book. This is lesson number 13 for December 26 of 2015. We hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. Well, we're going to enjoy some a, a, a sort of a bird's eye view of Jeremiah. We're going to pick out just a few of the main points of the book and talk about them. But there's a lot of materials in this lesson that um, I have added in addition to what was in our Bible study guide. So if you want to go to our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can download these lessons and get a lot of materials and things to think about that are touched here in the book of Jeremiah. Before we begin, we hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to be looking at a lot of texts. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, now as we look back over the life of Jeremiah and the incredible experiences he went through, the ups and the downs and mostly downs, uh, there are lessons, lessons that we should learn. You obviously preserved his records with the help of Baruch, who wrote for him, uh, for us to study many years later. May we not make the mistakes of those people who are constantly disobeying you and disobeying the words that you gave them through Jeremiah. Now guide us as we study these materials together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, we, have to, we have to be honest, first of all, that in this series of lessons, there are huge chunks of the book of Jeremiah that we haven't even touched. For example, there's a whole section in Jeremiah 46 to 51, which is basically uh, condemnations or prophecies against the surrounding nations. We didn't touch those at all. Uh, the Septuagint, which, which was one of the first, well, the first more or less complete translation of the, of the Hebrew uh, Old Testament, in what we call Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, into Greek, left out one-third of the book. Just left it out completely. We don't know why. One-third or one-eighth? One-eighth. Did I say a third? I'm sorry. One-eighth one -eighth of the book. We will depart somewhat from what the adult study Bible says because we want to include some additional what we think are very important questions. Do you think the study of Jeremiah has contributed anything to your understanding of God? And maybe a bigger question, if not to our understanding, what about the understanding of the onlooking universe? Did they learn anything from these experiences? Jeremiah versus almost everybody around him. Are there any things that make any details in the book of Jeremiah that sort of jump out at you that you think, wow, that's different, that's, that's, that's not something I have in Daniel or Ezekiel or some other part of the Old Testament? Everybody's thinking hard. You mean you're looking for something specific that's different than all I'm of them? I'm just asking, in our time together, is there anything that sort of sticks out in your mind that Really, I think God has remarkable tolerance, Amazing. But, there, but there is a limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for if sure. I, if I was observing from the outside, like we're kind of doing in this lesson, it's amazing to see how people, how a people that know God's character, can so readily turn away time after time and he's still so patient and patient and willing to work and yet again turn away. Finally, in the book of Jeremiah, he comes to the place where he has to let people go. A lot of them. Very, very sad story. Well, just, just very briefly in, in, in passing pa through, Jeremiah was a descendant of Eli. Remember the stories of Eli? and Abiathar, who, were, who was deposed from the high priesthood by David and Solomon. So they were pushed out of Jerusalem, and they lived in the small town about two and a half miles away, three miles away from Jerusalem, north, northeast of Jerusalem, in a small town called Abiathar. I'm sorry, 
a small town, town, town called Anathoth, which was the home of Abiathar. So as far as we can guess, best guess, Jeremiah was born around 644, 645 BC, and he began his ministry about 628, 29. So that would make him about how old? When God called him, when he thought he was too young? A teenager. 16. Well, a little bit older than that. No, 15, 16, 17, 17, 18 maybe. And his ministry continued until at least 586 BC when Jerusalem fell to the final time, for the final time uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. We also reviewed in our classes, uh, we've studied through this quarter, uh, that the book of Jeremiah is a hodgepodge as far as chrono chronology is concerned. Um, during the days of Manasseh, when Jeremiah was born, he didn't write anything in the first few years. He didn't write anything during the time of Ammon, Manasseh's first Manasseh's son. Then in the days of King Josiah, the one good king in this lot, uh, he wrote chapters 1 to 6 when he was called and chapters 14 to 16. And uh, then things become a little hodgepodge. He, Jehoiaz only reigned for three months. As far as you know, nothing was written during that time. But then back and forth and jumping around during the different kings and you can actually see reading in the in the Bible and you can trace most of this in the Bible had been Bible commentary that uh, there you know and why would that be Gordon you gave an answer to that at one point that that was pretty good well we have um, and I'm trying to remember exactly where it is that the king would uh, have would have read one section of of Jeremiah's scroll. I, read like, scroll. I don't like this. Cut it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Throw it in the fire. Another section. Cut it out. I don't like that. The next section. Same thing. So really what we have is rewriting mm -hmm. the whole book as Barak and Jeremiah remembered. Yeah. And not in a very good order. Yeah. And we don't know for sure how it got back in that order, but there it is. Well, during this time, Babylon rose to world dominance by conquering Assyria at Nineveh in 612 B.C., and later Egypt in Carchemish in 605 B.C. We talked a little bit about that last week. Jerusalem was conquered twice and then finally was besieged for 30 months and completely destroyed in July of 586 B.C. Well, so Jeremiah's life was lived under incredibly different circumstances than the circumstances that we live under. So would it be fair to say, well, things are so different in those days that we probably can't learn anything from him? Why would God preserve a book like that? Because the issues are the same. Yeah. Issues are the same. What kind of issues? Well, our, our Bible study guides suggest some, such as faithfulness to God and obedience to his commandments, such as true religion, a religion of the heart, as opposed to empty and dead rituals that can leave people in a false state of complacency, such as people's willingness to listen to correction, even when it cuts across what they want to hear, such as true revival and reformation, such as trusting in the Lord and His promises instead of the arm of flesh. Hmm. wonder if any of those things could apply to us. Well, we started out the book back in Jeremiah 2, 1 and 3, with some incredible words. Look at these words. The Lord told me to proclaim this message to everyone in Jerusalem. I remember how faithful you were when you were young. How you loved me when we were first married. You followed me through the desert, through a land that had not been sown. In Israel, you belonged to me alone. You were my sacred possession. I sent suffering and disaster on everyone who hurt you. I, the Lord, have spoken. So now it's obvious to all of you when that time period was that he was talking about, right? It's almost like uh, God's memory is really weak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was so complimentary, you know. And, and, uh, God is gracious. It's for Very sure. gracious. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, just the starkness of the... Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting that God says something like that in several other places. Well, Jeremiah 31, 18 to 20. Ezekiel 20, 4 to 26. Hosea 11, 1. God is incredibly but, but gracious. What, even religions today make, make God look like some sort of an ogre that needs to be satisfied and, yeah. and to satisfy his anger and the, the commands or the just 
demands of the law. And, yeah. and you know, what did the people do during that time that apparently is referred to in the wilderness? They j uh, danced naked and drunk around the golden calf. They yeah. did all sorts of terrible things. They in insisted on... Well, maybe during that short time when they were actually building the sanctuary. Oh, that's the month. That's the <laughs> week. <laughs> okay. Well, Jeremiah spent a great deal of time discussing the worship of other different of d worship of different so-called gods and how the people had left the true God to go after other so-called gods. And you don't have to read very far, almost anywhere in the book of Jeremiah, until you run across something about that. Can you name? Can you think of any other nation that changed its gods? Was Israel irreligious during that period? When God complained that they had changed gods, were they aware that they had done that? What were they actually doing? Syncretism with the people from the north country, the ba Baal worshippers yeah. and so forth. Well, they would, they, would, they would run out and worship the Baal, Baals and these, I mean, in different places it said, you know, you have put altars to Baal and Ashtoreth under every green tree and on top of every hill. Now, I certainly hope it wasn't quite that bad, but I mean, even to say something like that. You know, That's a little more exciting, though. They were getting along with their neighbors, getting along with other religions. They were... Politically <laughs> correct? Was yeah, politically <laughs> correct. Yeah. I don't want to stick them in the eye with the truth. Well, some of them at least were paying their tithe and worshiping on the Sabbath. They were observing all the so-called ceremonial requirements. Did they really know God? And what was so attractive in those heathen religions? Well, they had spirits, uh, spirits of liquid spirits. And what, why, yeah, you know, some liquid spirits you pour out of a bottle. There you go. Or a jug. In, jug in those days, yeah. Why does God have such a hard time holding on to his people and getting them to worship him? Gives them lots of freedom. So are you assuming that um, it was actually easy to worship God back then? I mean, you read the text just like I do. What do you think? Was, is it difficult? Well, I, I don't know how I could make a judgment on that, but it just seems like the, through the whole time, they just weren't able to do it. Um, doesn't God have the power to do it? does have the power to do it, but maybe that's yeah, that's the whole question right there. Um, remember that are God you lied. supposed to rely on that power or are you supposed to do it yourself? Remember that God lost a third of the angels. I mean, here they are in heaven, in God's presence, and he couldn't keep them. But don't you think that could still have the same problem even back then? Okay, what was the problem? whether or not you could actually be good on your own power. You think that was the issue in heaven? Yeah. Don't you think Satan wanted to be God? So yeah. if he wanted to be God, he would do it himself. Oh, so you're talking about Lucifer himself. You're not talking about the people he deceived, or the angels he deceived. No, even the angels. Mm -hmm. Even the angels. I mean, what he did is he looked they at himself Find out how he got in the situation, and he figured out how to get everybody else in the same yeah. situation. Thinking that somehow or other, by rebelling, they could make things better for themselves. They were thinking only of themselves. Of course, nobody does that today, not in our church, right? Well, do you think they understood what rebellion meant back then, even in heaven? I mean, if they did, well, then why would we have to go through this on earth? Maybe maybe well, this whole thing is being revealed to everyone. We probably it's, it's been going on in the universe for maybe several cycles, and they you, know, you have the we have creation. It might even have been some creation before that, uh, the way I could read it, and then you have after the flood another another type of creation with with only eight people, and then he brings the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, starts over with a, with a, a segment, and. You have to keep starting over. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, people don't tend to not learn, but that's why I guess why you end up with just a remnant is going to learn. So let's let's be very clear. What we want to talk about now: Do we understand the core issues in the Great Controversy? Do we? I'm going to ask you. Do you? Uh, and then the the thing, the questions I'm going to ask to follow with is: Okay, do we learn anything from Jeremiah about those core issues? Core, well, one of the core issues of, of the great controversy is what is God really like? What's his character? What is he really like? And what does he want from his, from his intelligent creatures? There's a lot of people who think that the great controversy, even the people who, who know a little bit about the great controversy, just think it's a, it's a battle between good and evil. Is that what? No, it's over the character and government of God and that God has been accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, and forgiving, exacted, severe, tyrannical, and despotic. And it takes a long time to explain that that isn't, is not the case. And then mere denial on God's part does not settle it in the minds of intelligent creatures. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that God's big mistake, I'm putting that in quotation marks, back in the beginning is giving us too much freedom. No. No? But there is a problem with, with love. Mm -hmm. Love means the freedom to make a choice. And that choice is not with the coercion or, or duress or extortion uh, it, it's it, yeah God doesn't want to be a prison have prison guards for eternity yeah I have said sometime in the past and I want you to think about it out there God could save everybody all he would have to do is turn heaven into a solitary confinement prison and he put everybody even the devil in a in a single person cell so they can't hurt we couldn't hurt each other and stick a little food into us every day, and he could save everybody, right? That's pure speculation, and if God is love, he couldn't do it that way. Right. There's a couple things God, things God cannot do, and he can't force his will upon intelligent because creatures. He, he, he couldn't live with himself yeah. if that were the case. Yeah. He couldn't, and he can't because he's love. God is love, First yeah, John. Very elementary, and he never changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what did we say about freedom in the, this point? Without freedom to make a choice, there is no love. And if God is love, he could only create intelligent creatures that have the capacity to make the choice. But the choice isn't because, well, do it or I'm going to blow your brains out. Do it. Uh, you, will way, just, you will die. In a, way, in a way, though, he's saying if you do that, you are going to die. Yeah. So it's kind of a threat. Well, it's a warning in the nature of a warning. If you're up on the top of a steep roof and you're going to replace the, sh the shingles and you don't put on your safety gear and you don't, uh, and you don't leave off your leather sole shoes and put on rubber sole shoes and so on and so forth, uh, maybe the safety ropes or whatever it is, natural result, you will die. You have a two-year-old kid running down the driveway to, and, uh, to uh, the run street. the risk into the street and, and you warn well, the kid isn't listening, He's, so you have to raise your voice, get the attention of the kid. The onlookers, they say, what's going on? They don't see the kid running. They see you acting like a, what they think is acting like a fool. Now, God has, has to run that risk. If, That's one, uh, one way of looking at things. If God could accomplish what he wants most by the use of force or power, the great controversy would have been over as soon as it began. That God would have just simply said, snuffed out Lucifer as soon as he started rebelling, and that would be it. But God can't accomplish, because of the freedom issue, he can't accomplish what he wants by the use of power. <coughs> Excuse me. But it James 2, 19, up, what? It doesn't end up as you're going to die. Yep. And it's yep. a warning. I yep. mean, even, even um, he told that to Adam and Eve, you eat the fruit, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So isn't it? It's, it's a warning, but it's also a threat. It's very interesting to observe that Israel, going back to Jeremiah's day, was not irreligious during this time. They're not like turning very secular like our, our country is today. They were worshiping. They were just worshiping the wrong things. And they turned away from God, the Yahweh, to worship all these other crazy things. What does it? What would it do to you to worship a glued-together God? 
What would a worship, what it do, First Samuel 5, you can read the story there. What good would it, I mean, what would it do to you to worship a piece of firewood God? You have to nail them down to keep them from falling over. <laughs> I just, it just, you know, what, what do you think that, you know, you go out to the woods and you cut down a tree and you carve half of it into a God and the other half you use to warm your lunch. What, what does that do to you? Well, when you form a God that you can see and touch and feel, well, then that's going to be it. Well, you know? okay, but why? Well, let's think about that for a minute. What is the attractiveness of having a God that you can see and touch and feel? You can control it. You can move it where you want. Well, I, I, I can think of the stories, but I better not take the time to tell them. But, I mean, what did... What did Eli, Eli's sons do. We're going to force God to help us beat the Philistines because we're going to take the ark with us down into battle. And then God will have to fight for us, right? What happened? They lost the ark. God says, I'm not going to be manipulated like that. Well, I think that moving him around like that is a good point because you, you tend to put him where you want him to be. Yeah. Um, it's just like when the people went to Egypt, they took they took um, Jeremiah with them because they thought they were moving God with them. Okay, so, we have plenty of evidence from Zechariah Jeremiah that they were running back and forth between worshiping God, so Yahweh in the in Solomon's temple, however lame that was, and these other gods. We know by the, from the vision of, of Ezekiel eight that they eventually brought the pagan worship right into Solomon's temple so they didn't have to even run out. They can, you know, there and come here. What do you think they thought was the difference between the real God and all these other gods they were worshiping? What do you think was going on in their mind? Well, some people have said that they, they thought all the gods were the same God and some people think that they were all different gods. So... Um, did they think that having worshiping two gods was like having two fire insurance policies? Better coverage. Better coverage. <laughs> hmm. Better. Why does it seem that the devil has more power over us than God? We sort of naturally bent in that direction. Yeah. God respects our freedom. The Satan, devil doesn't. He does not, absolutely. Our freedom to choose. Can we? I realize we? that, but, but yeah. you... It, you Why? You, you feel like God's over here and he's got this little piece of the pie of my life and the devil gets all the rest of it to tempt me with. Yeah. Well, can you truly worship two different gods at the same time? You can't have allegiance to two. No. Jesus, what did Jesus say? You can't worship... Serve two masters. God can't serve two masters. Okay. There's no way to compare the God we worship with any of those false gods. He finally actually came down to this earth and demonstrated what kind of a God he is it what kind of a God is real, what he was really like. And I quote now from Ellen White, this is Great Controversy page uh, 651, paragraph two. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt and shame of sin in the hiding of his father's face. That would be the hiding of his father's face. What's the other word for that? God's wrath, right? Till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross, that the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. Wow. And we'd give up that and substitute a piece of firewood, God? Is God angry when we worship other gods, or do we just lose by becoming like them? The latter, mostly. Yeah. 
there's lots of places, even in Rome, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2, verse 5, verse 19, Jeremiah 7, 19, Hosea 9, 10, Romans 1, 18 to 31. I said there's a lot of verses in this, in this thing. We just don't have time to look at all of them. How many different gods were they actually worshiping? Well, look at these verses. Jeremiah 2, 32 and 33. Does a young woman forget her jewelry or bride or bride her wedding dress? But my people have forgotten me for more days than can be counted. You certainly know how to chase after lovers. Even the worst of women can learn from you. Your clothes are stained with the blood of the poor and innocent, not with the blood of burglars. And that's just a thing, a comment about how, uh, let me see, I think this is, Here's one of these verses. I'm trying to remember which one it is. The, here it is. Jeremiah 11:13. The people of Judah have as many gods as they have cities, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem have set up as many altars for sacrifices to that disgusting god Baal as there are streets in the city. You suppose all those altars were still there as Jerusalem was being sieged? So were they praying to Baal, please... Help us rescue us from Nebuchadnezzar. Well, it's interesting that God told them through Jeremiah, he, he made them admit, really. God repeatedly pleaded with them to come back to him and admit that. And this is Jeremiah 3, verses 23 and 24, way back at the beginning. We were not helped at all by our pagan worship on the hilltops. Help for Israel comes only from the Lord our God. But the worship of Baal, the God of shame has made us lose flocks and herds, sons and daughters, everything that our ancestors have worked for, us for since ancient times. Why couldn't they get that message? Well, I don't know if it, it, it's hard for us who have become died in the world Christians, and most of us have been, probably grew up being Christians from the time we were children, uh, it's hard for us to imagine why people would want to worship all these other gods, all these other pieces of junk, basically. Um, do we have any true idea of why they did that, why they turned away from God? Well, in my opinion, I'm going to voice my opinion here. In my opinion, one of the biggest gaps in the Bible, if there is a gap in the Bible, is that there's so little discussion of what sin actually does to people. Adam and Eve could walk comfortably in God's presence. If we saw God in His glory today, it would consume us instantly. Exodus 33, verse 20, and other places. What has changed? You think God has changed? No. He says repeatedly He doesn't change, right? If we understood better what sin does to us, maybe we would not be so comfortable with it. I mean, let's be honest, we're surrounded by sin. And we, we just sort of, you know, maybe we're not, we're not happy about it, but we just sort of settle down and there we are, you know? I'd add to that, not only what it does to us, but what it does to God. Mm -hmm. Like Moses was, didn't want to sin because of how it affected God. Yeah. And we often don't think that either. Mm -hmm. And Job. Well, what would you say about a God who says, don't even pray for your friends and family who have been taken into captivity? Why would he say that? Look at Jeremiah 7, verse 16. The Lord said, Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Do not cry or pray on their behalf. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. Look what the children or people are doing. It goes on from there. Mm -hmm. Is it that God wouldn't listen or the people wouldn't listen to God? Well, does it do any good to pray for someone who is blatantly misbehaving and has no intention of changing? What do you do? Why would God not want to forgive? Will such a thing ever happen again? It's not an issue of forgiveness. Yeah. God forgives everybody, good, bad, and ugly. They're all forgiven. The problem is nobody wants to change their thinking of, of uh, how they understand God. 
So they listen to the pagan. Go to the last book in the Bible, the last chapter of the last book, Revelation 22. Here's the verses 11 and 12. Whoever is evil must go on doing evil. Whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good. And whoever is holy must go on being holy. What does that tell us? Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give each one according to what he has done. How do we know when it's no good praying for someone anymore, though? Well, Jeremiah was told straight by God, wasn't he? So I, I don't think we're the ones who make those kind of decisions. If God told us somehow or other, okay, it's too late to pray for somebody, then I suppose I would have to accept that. But uh, So he's just plain saying there's a point you can go where you can't come back. What do we call that? What did Jesus call that in the New Testament? Do you remember? We use the term unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin. What, what's the unpardonable sin? It's when you don't want to be pardoned. <laughs> that's, that's about right. Yeah. 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 It, when you are so fast-headed in the other direction, you say, God, leave me alone. Holy Spirit, leave me alone. Angels, leave me alone. I'm doing my own thing. I don't need your help. Just leave me alone. I mean, what's God supposed to do? If you say it repeatedly, he has to believe that you mean it. He'll yeah. still try to talk to you, but you'll still reject him. So you if you see these people that say, I've, cr I've committed the unpardonable sin, and they feel guilty and they're all that because they've done that, have they? No. Probably not. If they feel guilty and they're worried about it, it's very likely that they have not committed the unpardonable sin. The person who's committed the unpardonable sin, who's headed the other direction as fast as he goes, and he says, I don't care. I don't have no desire to have anything to do with God. After yeah. seeing a clear picture of him. Mm -hmm. we got to remember that because there's a lot of tricks going around where you, mm -hmm. you, people will say you can commit the unpardonable sin and you're, that's mm -hmm. it. Well, do you think that the people that Jeremiah, remember there were times when Jeremiah was told to go out and stand in front of the temple at, during, during Passover, during some major holiday, and preached to all the people who were coming and going. Do you think most of those people understand what he was trying, understood what he was trying to say to them? Or was it just completely over their heads? I think they understood it. It was just whether they wanted to believe it or not. Did they really believe that they were in out and out rebellion against God? No. They were religious people. They, tithe, pay, pay, they paid tithe, they uh, kept the Sabbath, they had health reforming. Are you trying to tie something together here? They're like us. Oh, oh dear. Um, look at Jeremiah 9 verses 23 and 24. What should we learn from these verses? The Lord says, the wise, do we have any people who think they're wise today? Should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. Do we hear any of that kind of stuff going on on TV these days? If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me. Because my love is constant, and I do what is just and right, these are the things that please me. Is it all right to boast that we know God? If, if you really knew God, would you be afraid to boast? <laughs> Dangerous ground if you start to boast. <laughs> well, Paul had no problem with boasting about God, so I don't think so. Let me read that, Romans 1, 16 and 17. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. I have complete confidence. What do you think of that? Isn't that boasting? But if you have a, today have a clear picture of God and you're boasting that you know him so well, you're going to be in contradiction between the other people that, are, that boast that claim they know him as well. Okay. 
So what's the plan of salvation or the gospel all about? Most people, most Christians, let me limit it to Christians, most Christians believe that the gospel is the good news about how God is going to save you and me. I would have to say that as I read the Bible, and especially as I add in the writings of Ellen White, the gospel is the truth about God's character and his government. Say that again. The truth is that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be. Is that Paul Hubeck? Yeah, that was Paul Hubeck. He was asked, you know, what... I know. Um, what divided the universe back in the beginning? Are we surprised to find such insights about God in the Old Testament? What was the actual covenant that God wanted to have for his people? Do you remember? Write the law on their hearts. Remember the famous words in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34? The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant, a new agreement, a new promise with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. What would happen if we had that kind of a relationship with God? The world would be a vastly different place. If we really understand what kind of religion God wants, would we realize that the most, it's the most natural thing in the world to, to grow up, both intellectually and spiritually? Would we start doing right because it is right? One very interesting commentator outside of religion, by and large, wrote, there's a document that records God's endless, dispiriting struggle with organized religion, known as the Bible. Is that really true? Well, not completely. Wouldn't you say that the, the forms of religion that were developed even in the Old Testament were pretty well organized? He just didn't get much cooperation, right? Well, see what you think of this. God asks of us a very simple thing. He asks us to make him the number one thing in our lives. Now, that's really hard because we have to take self off of the throne and put God on the throne. Not easy. Simple to, dis to explain, it's not easy to do. He asked to us to keep him constantly in view in our thoughts and in our desires. He asked us to study the Bible to learn what kind of a person he is. If we are willing to put aside our selfishness and prejudice and really come to know our Heavenly Father, we will gradually come to be like him. And Jim, what does your favorite verse say? John 17, 3. Eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. Eternal life. That's eternal life, just to know God. This work works by the natural laws of the mind. This mind here, the ones we have here. Just as small children go to be like their parents by observing and copying in every way they can, God asks us to observe and copy Him. We cannot do that on our own. This is not something we can earn our way to heaven. It is completely beyond our power. But God will do it for us if we simply give him the opportunity to do, by doing our best to observe and copy. Do, do small children say, let me see, I want to be like mom and dad. Now what are they doing? Let me see, how, can I, how do they become like mom and dad? They observe. They just, they just see them do it and they try to copy, right? Is that complicated? It's not complicated to, to talk about. Could, could we do that with God? Yeah. He's given 
us lots of examples. Second Corinthians eighteen, Second Corinthians three eighteen, describes that in, in sort of cryptic language. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever increase, ever greater degree of glory which is a lot of a little bit complicated language even though it's my simplified English version what God is saying is if you focus on me you will come to become like me Ellen White said it in words that we understand a lot easier in modern terms it is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed the mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is it accustomed to love and reverence. So if we spend all our time watching television, what do we become like? The monsters that are on TV, I guess. The monsters that are on TV. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will, ever, he will never attain to anything more exalted. So if self is still on the throne in your, in your life, that's talking about you. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. So can we do this by ourselves? Not at all. Left himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Great Controversy, 555, Paragraph 1. So. Great statement there. Yeah. So our ability to be saved is our ability to be able to dwell on God. And that's all, what you've been discussing here is all teaching mm -hmm. on the part of God. There's nothing that is, that is pointed out of, of a payment of a penalty. No. What a pagan concept that we've been. Yeah fed for years and years and years. So, so we can dwell on God. Well, does the small child dwell on his parents? He might. He might not. Well, I mean, you know. I've seen lots of children that don't dwell on their kids, their parents at all. If you watch them closely, you will find if they spend any time with their parents. Now, of course, if they're always shipped out, I mean, to a, to a babysitter or something like that, then that's a different story. But children who spend time with their parents they will copy their parents. Mm. It just happens. It's very, very natural. So all you have to do is be there. Yeah. It's a big part of it. Yeah. So how do we be there with God? Well, that's exactly know, the question. How do you know when you're being there with God? Okay. Well, I mean, I can tell when you're there with your parents because, hey, Mom, here you are. Yeah. Now, now, God, everybody thinks that they're with God, but... Um, by the way they act, it doesn't mean that they, they are. Let me read you just to go ahead, go ahead. We are with God by reading the Bible, right. praying, witnessing, studying Him. That's yeah. how we're with Him. And, and if you graze kids without that, what a, that's child abuse. Mm -hmm. So it's the Bible. That, you know, the Bible is kind of a, made out of paper and ink. Um, it's not really a person the ideas that are there. The ideas? Let, let, let me just give you a few passages from Jeremiah, because that's what we're talking about. Look at Jeremiah 5, verses 4 and 5. Then I thought, now this is Jeremiah, <coughs> then I thought, these are only the poor and ignorant. Maybe the reason these people aren't getting it is because they are not the intelligentsia of the nation. They behave foolishly. They don't know what their God requires, what the Lord wants them to do. So that's one of the things we need to find out. What does, God want, God was, what does God want us to do? I will go to the people in power and talk with them. Surely they know what their God requires, what the Lord wants them to do, but all of them have rejected the Lord's authority and refused to obey Him. So what was the problem? And go on from there, it says, And therefore a lion from the forest shall slay them, and a wolf from the desert shall destroy them. Mm -hmm. Leopard, leopard, go on and on. It, and people say, well, but God's going to do that. No, he just has to let them go. Yeah. It seems like the default position of human nature is 
do something and that to think you're going to change God's mind, uh, paganism, mm -hmm. and violence. That seems to uh, what we so read. It sounds yeah. like you can observe him, but you can you don't necessarily are going to change into him. Well, you can be like Lucifer if you choose to rebel. You can be right next to God's throne and rebel against him if you well, really I want to. I thought it was a law that if you observe God, you will change like him. You become well, like him. Sufficient, perhaps. So you have the opportunity to be like Satan. Him. Satan was with God. Um, we and still he have knew him, him we very well. Him. I'm reading Jeremiah 9, verses 3 and 4. They are always, he's talking about these people again, they're always ready to tell lies. Dishonesty instead of truth rules the land. The Lord says, my people do one evil thing after another and do not acknowledge me as their God. Everyone must be on guard against his friend and no one can trust his brother. For every brother is, a is as deceitful as Jacob and everyone slanders his friends. I mean, you know, in that kind of environment, what happens to people? And unfortunately, we don't have time to go back and go on and read. I have a bunch of other passages in here. Um, who do you suppose loses if everyone around you is critically exact? Who do you suppose would lose if everyone around would critically examine the reasons for his or her faith? If we really followed the truth where it leads, what would happen? It's often suggested that religion is a matter of the heart and not of the mind. But the heart is, not, is really only good for pumping blood. So what do we mean by these expressions? In Jeremiah's day, the heart was thought to be the seat of thinking and reason. And the bowels, the stomach, the seat of the emotions. And so here we have this comment. This is from uh, the New Geneva Study Bible. I think it's pretty good. Scripture speaks of knowing God as a spiritual person's ideal. That's what we really want to accomplish. Namely, the fullness of a faith relationship that brings salvation and eternal life, generating love, hope, and obedience, and joy. And there's a bunch of verses, starting with these Exodus 33:13. The dimensions of this knowledge are intellectual, knowing the truth about God, Deuteronomy 7, 9, and Psalm 100, verse 3. Volitional, trusting, obeying, and worshiping God. And moral, practicing justice and love, Jeremiah 22, 16, and 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Faith's knowledge focuses on Jesus Christ, the incarnate God and the mediator between God and man. Faith seeks specifically to know Christ and his power, Philippians 4, 8, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 3, 8 to 14. The knowledge fostered by God's covenant agreement with us is reciprocal with our affection on, with affection on both sides, we know God as ours because he knows us as his. John 10, 14, Galatians 4, 9, and 2 Timothy 2, 19. Well, have we as Seventh-day Adventists come to a place where we are not, a, not of much use to God anymore? Is he ready to give up on us forever? Will there ever be a time when we could actually say something good and specific about our God? Unfortunately, I remember the time many years ago now when a president of the United States in those days, a, a small group of Adventists got a chance to meet him in a time when he was, in a casual time, he wasn't busy doing anything. And he said, oh yeah, I think I remember something about Adventists. Weren't you partly responsible for the discovery of peanut butter. <laughs> great, great, tremendous. Well, could we ever, as a group, stand up and say, God is like this, as, as he presents himself in scripture, he is not like this as Satan wants us to believe he is. Could we do that? He's not the kind of God that some of his so-called friends have made him out to be. What was Israel saying to the nations about their God? And here's an inc incredible statement. This is now found in, from Ellen White. This is Signs of the Times, July, 20, July 12, 1899. She's just finished writing great, I mean, Desire of Ages. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption 
that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. So who's God, who does God have to deal with? The entire universe. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure. In other words, the truth about God has to be demonstrated. Even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. What's it talking about? The, even though the race be wiped out. Who's he talking about? Who's she talking about? Humans. The entire human. said it's more important for the truth about God to be known and nailed down for sure than even the survival of the human race. Now, that is absolutely heresy in the, in the eyes of most Christians who think that the gospel is all about how God is going to save you and me, especially me. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, this is talking about his coming, all doubts would be forever settled. So he's going to clear up the, he's going to clarify the truth about God. And the human race would, race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the, unfall, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. Why? The truth would be irrefutably demonstrated. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth, his trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion? Who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan, and his angels. That's incredible. And they'd be quiet. Well, there's nothing more to say. When you see how God, when you see God demonstrating what kind of person he is under the very worst kind of circumstances, what can you say? Isn't that the seventh the seal being opened? There is quiet in heaven for yeah. Well, we've come now in the story of Jeremiah, particularly, to a time when God has to finally just give people up. How did he feel about that? There's a couple of verses found in Hosea when he was having to give up the northern kingdom that describe that very well. Look at Hosea 11, verses 7 and 8. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were two small cities that were, were there with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. What do you say about a God who feels like that? Well, as we approach the end of their kingdom, do we see the picture of God as given by Jeremiah and others getting more and more obscure and confused or more and more clear? Doesn't it seem almost like the darker the background, that is the general condition of the people, the brighter the picture of God and his character appears? Does our knowledge of God make us feel different? Give us an exhilarating sense of freedom. Think of all the people who think that worshiping God is a burden. John 15, 16, and 7. He yeah. says, message to, that you can have joy. Yeah. Joy, joy. I mean, it, it's, uh, you don't have to wait in the by and by. You could have some joy now to understand the truth about yeah. God. There is no worse loss of freedom than to feel fear. Does your knowledge of God make you afraid? Are you afraid of what God might do for you and might do to you in the future? Remember 1 John 4, 18? I'll read it. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. Hmm. Is it fair for the good to suffer with the bad? Jeremiah suffered even though he was good and had done his best to warn the people of what would come if they did not repent. How honored was Jeremiah in his day? I don't think honored at all. Uh, very little. I mean, they wanted to kill him. His own family from Anathoth wanted to kill him. He goes to the temple, tries to witness, and God says, go and hide, because if they see you out there, they'll kill you. Send your, send your secretary out there to read the messages. I mean, they threw him in that well to sink down in the mud. What did they think was going to happen to him? 
He's going to die. Well, in this story of Jeremiah, as we're concluding, he's worked with the children of Israel for about how long? 800 years. 800 years, from about 1400 and some years B.C. down to 600 years B.C. Does God seem to be enjoying a great deal of success so far? Doesn't seem that way, does yeah, it? Wow. Few, but not many. Isolated. What, what do you think, I mean, as we've read Jeremiah now, what does God seem to be working toward? So, is it clear what God's trying to accomplish in all this mess? And I would repeat what I said earlier, is the problem that God doesn't have power. It's not about power. There are a lot of people who preach, man, if God would just come down and do the things I think he should do, just exercise his power, the whole world would be converted, right? Remember years ago, there was a fellow named uh, Paul Crouch. He says uh, God's going to come back or, and uh, he's going to set up uh, and make him, him the FCC commissioner and he was going to give the um, FCC licenses to the Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, he's de been dead now for several years, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, may I remind you now, God has worked with Christians for almost 2,000 years. And he's worked with Adventists since the great disappointment in 1840 for more, for 1844 for more than 171 years. Is he getting tired? What do we have to say? The Father in his wisdom knows when the, right, when the time is ripe. Yeah. Well, Second Peter 3, verse 10 to 12 says, we should work for the coming. We should work to hasten it on. Surely what God has been waiting for in light of everything I read in Jeremiah is for us to make, to present to the world a clear picture of God, the truth about God and about his character, to, to, to refute all the errors that have been perpetrated against God by Satan's plans and his activities and so forth. And just, if we could make the picture of God crystal clear, somehow or other, if we could live and preach and teach that truth, Satan would be defeated and the end would be able to come. And that, my friends, should be what God wants us to learn. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of studying your word, of seeing all these events and the, the way you worked with Jeremiah through those incredible experiences. We're afraid that we have the truth revealed to us through our year serpent Ellen White that things toward the end of this world's history, somewhere not far in the distant future now, may be even worse. If it's your will, may we be a part of it. May we be able to stand faithful and true to you through those, through those final hours is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.